The concept of the vampire has evolved over time, and has its roots in various cultures and mythologies. In this video, I'm going to delve into some of the major interpretations of the vampire, as there are wildly different takes on what this creature is. We'll try to track down the most ancient forms known, and we'll follow the path through the centuries and into modern media and games. Before we break open this crypt of blood-stained coffins, make sure to drive a stake through the like button, and don't forget to subscribe. I release regular content about fantastical lore, monsters and adventures for Dungeons and & Dragons, and other associated fantasy content. Having you along makes this whole journey worthwhile. One of the earliest known vampire-like creatures is the Akaru, which was described in ancient Sumerian and Babylonian myths. The Akaru were blood-drinking demons that would attack and drain the life force of their victims. The ancient Greeks also had stories of creatures that drank blood, such as the Lamia, a female demon who preyed upon young children. However, the most famous vampire lore comes from Eastern Europe. In countries like Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria, the legend of the vampire emerged during the Middle Ages. The vampire was typically portrayed as a person who returned from the dead with an inescapable craving for blood. In the 18th and 19th centuries, literature and popular culture helped to popularize the vampire myth beyond Eastern Europe. Bram Stoker's novel Dracula is widely regarded as the most influential vampire story, and it has shaped the modern popular image of vampires as suave, charismatic, and powerful undead beings. In the 20th century, the concept of the vampire continued to evolve and change in popular culture. With the publication of Anne Rice's Interview with a Vampire in 1976, the vampire began to be portrayed as a romantic and tragic figure. Rice's vampires were immortal beings who struggled with their existence, and often formed deep emotional bonds with humans. In the 1990s and into the 2000s, the vampire became a popular figure in young adult fiction and television shows. In these stories, vampires were often portrayed as brooding, attractive teenagers who struggled with their supernatural powers and their forbidden love for humans. Vampires have also been a prominent kind of creature in tabletop role-playing games and in video games. The earliest edition of Dungeons & Dragons featured vampires as a powerful variety of undead, and they still occupy this role into the current edition. The tabletop RPG Vampire the Masquerade was published in 1991, which focused exclusively on vampires. In this game, players take on the roles of vampires in a secret society that operates in the shadows. The game emphasizes storytelling, character development, and the struggle to maintain the masquerade, which is the rule that vampires must not reveal their existence to humans. Vampires have also played important roles in several successful video game franchises, such as Castlevania, which features Dracula as the final boss, and The Elder Scrolls, which has both vampire enemies and NPCs, and the chance for your own character to become a vampire. There have been countless variations on the vampire myth. Certain elements have more or less remained consistent, such as the need for blood, the immortality, and the supernatural powers, but it seems there is no end to the ways in which this creature has been reimagined. In trying to track down the earliest recorded vampire-like creatures, I came upon a few interesting specimens. The Akaru is a type of vampire-like creature that originated in ancient Sumerian mythology. Being that this is so old, it's very difficult to get a precise date range on when this creature first became recorded or codified, but Sumerian mythology in general is dated to the 4th and the 3rd millennium BC, so we've got a range there of about 4000 to 2001 BC. The Akaru are described as a race of blood-drinking demons or spirits that prey on humans. 
especially on pregnant women and young children. The Akaru were said to be the offspring of the demon goddess Tiamat and were associated with the underworld and darkness. Tiamat, by the way, was the goddess of the ocean and chaos and was one of the earliest and most powerful deities. She was depicted as a fierce dragon or serpent with multiple heads. Tiamat was seen as a symbol of chaos and destruction and maelstroms. She was believed to have created the world from the primordial chaos that existed before creation. She was defeated by the god Marduk, but Tiamat remained an important figure in Sumerian mythology, and her symbolism was carried forward into later Mesopotamian cultures, where she was associated with the underworld and with death. And, as you might know, Dungeons & Dragons features a five-headed evil dragon goddess called Tiamat. Mm -hmm. So the Akaru serves here as a almost proto-vampire. They're not as well known as other vampire-type creatures in modern culture, but they have been referenced in some works of fantasy and horror literature. I should also take a quick moment to mention Lilith, as she is also a somewhat vampire-like creature whose origin traces back to ancient Mesopotamia. She would prey upon people, typically men and infants, and she was associated with the night and darkness. As I read up on a bunch of different Lilith lore, I quickly discovered that this topic is a total rabbit hole and would really require its own video. She has been wildly reinterpreted again and again from ancient times to the Middle Ages to modern day. Moving on to medieval myth and folklore, we come across the Upir from Slavic legends, also called Upior, Vupir, and Vapir, depending upon the region. This is truly the beginning of the vampire. It is a nocturnal, undead person who drinks the blood of the living and has supernatural powers. You might be wondering, what's the deal with all the blood drinking? So, the belief here is that when someone died, his soul would leave his body, and this is an invisible spirit that floated and flew through the air. It would linger around for 40 days before moving on to the afterlife it was possible for the soul to re-enter the dead body, and it was also possible for other souls or unclean evil spirits to enter the dead body. So there was a huge emphasis on getting a dead person buried quickly, because a physical barrier would prevent the spirit or some other evil force from getting into the corpse. The upir, or vampire, thus was a corpse that became reanimated by its own soul or the evil spirit coming into it, and as the body would soon begin rotting, it needed fresh living blood in order to sustain itself. The word upir was introduced into English as vampire, originally with a Y-R-E at the end, instead of the I-R-E that we use nowadays. So this vampire word was introduced into English by Romantic poets, notably Lord Byron in 1813 and John William Polidori in 1819. Then in 1897, we get Bram Stoker's gothic novel Dracula, which opened the vampiric floodgates on the world. I personally don't have any qualms with the vampire having so much variation and a bunch of different ancient and medieval influences weaving together. Many great things in human society originate as a convergence of multiple sources of inspiration. Creatures like vampires or holidays like Christmas and Halloween have so many different threads weaving them together, so many creative forces that arose to produce them and that continue feeding in fresh ideas and interpretations as time goes on, typically with the best of the variants standing the test of time.
I too have recently taken it upon myself to delve into some creative work with the vampire, as it is featured as a character class in a 5e book that I'm working on called Monstrous Heroes. Actually, it serves as both your race and your class combined. And when I set about conceptualizing the vampire here, I really thought about what were a few of the most iconic vampire archetypes. I came up with four vampire subclasses known as Bloodlines, the Dark Beguiler, the Nocturne, the Strigoi, and the Vampiric Warrior. Now, all vampire characters in the book share certain core features, such as a bite that drains blood and special traits that make you difficult to permanently kill. The subclasses expand upon these baseline abilities. Dark Beguilers are vampires with powerful, mind-influencing abilities. They have a charming gaze, an insidious beckoning that draws targets closer, and even the ability to bind thralls to their service and dominate minds completely. Nocturnes are arcane scholars, essentially vampire wizards that weave shadow magic in with their spellcasting. In time, they can siphon life energy from targets via their spells and even feed upon the magical energy of other spellcasters. Strigoi are the most monstrous and feral of vampires, perhaps what we might refer to as Nosferatu. They are deadly with their bites and claws, latch onto their prey to drain blood even faster while simultaneously using the target as a sort of living shield. And after gaining some levels, a Strigoi can shapeshift into a bat and call upon nocturnal beasts. Last, but certainly not least, is the Vampiric Warrior, an elite swordsman who combines weapon and armor expertise with dark powers. They can drain life through their weapon strikes, afflict their enemies with blood flow, and even deal crippling blows that paralyze the target. Check out the link down in the video description. It will take you to my Kickstarter for Monstrous Heroes. You will find all kinds of things there beyond just the vampire. There's a bunch of monster class options like Minotaur, Ogre, Arachnir, many more. In fact, there are now over 14 new classes, plus spells, items, and Game Master material. This book will inject new energy into your player characters, and it will provide GMs with options to create more dynamic enemies and NPCs, and to run campaigns in more monstrous and exotic settings. There's a big free sample PDF, so you can start using Monstrous Heroes right away, along with trailers and teasers of many kinds. The Kickstarter also gives you access to add-on adventure modules created by your dear bardic friend here, so don't miss out on all that. Moving into contemporary decades, the writer Anne Rice had a significant impact on popular culture's perception of vampires. Her influential Vampire Chronicles book series, which began with Interview with a Vampire, presented a very different view of vampires than the traditional folklore and the popular vampire literature that had come before. Rice's vampires were complex, sympathetic characters. They had rich inner lives and a wide range of emotions. They were not simply evil monsters, but rather beings with deep desires, fears, regrets even. Her vampires were also portrayed as sensual and sexual. This is basically the origin of the sexy vampire trope. They also had a deep sense of history and culture, drawing upon centuries of human civilization and artistic expression. They are still technically undead and do not age or die of natural causes, but they are certainly closer to humans than how vampires were imagined in traditional myth and folklore. Rice's vampires were not affected by some of the traditional vampire weaknesses, such as running water, holy water, crosses, garlic, but they still slept in coffins and were greatly harmed or even destroyed by sunlight. 
Overall, Rice's depictions of vampires played a huge role in redefining the genre and broadening its appeal to a wider audience. Her books became bestsellers and inspired a new wave of vampires, including the popular Twilight series and the television show True Blood. Speaking of Twilight, we should take a glance at how the series reimagined vampires because it was a massive success and at the very least is going to serve as a contrast because the vampires in the Twilight books, as depicted by author Stephanie Mayer, have some notable differences from traditional vampires. Unlike with tradition, the vampires in Twilight are not harmed by sunlight. This is a major deviation. Instead, their skin sparkles like diamonds in the sun and even makes them more beautiful and alluring. This sparkle effect occurs because their bodies have a crystalline component. Oh. While traditional vampires must drink human blood to survive, the vampires in Twilight can survive on animal blood instead of human blood, which allows them to coexist with humans without posing a direct threat to them. Oh. In addition to being immortal and possessing superhuman strength and speed, the vampires in Twilight also have a variety of other abilities, such as the ability to read minds or see the future. In the Twilight setting, humans can be transformed into vampires through a process that involves being bitten by a vampire and then going through a painful and lengthy transformation period. This is actually similar to how vampires are created in Anne Rice's novels. Overall, the vampires in Twilight present a more romanticized and fantastical view of vampires which has been credited with making the genre more appealing to younger audiences. At the same time, people have endlessly debated and criticized Mayer's vampires because they aren't harmed by sunlight, they don't sleep in coffins, and overall they don't have any very significant weaknesses. They have no fangs and don't have to prey upon humans. They tend to be more generic, hyper-idealized type of personalities, some even argue that they are not true vampires. So we could say that vampires have come quite a long way from being Mesopotamian demons and medieval undead killers. Over time, they have become more and more human, more and more social. Of course, these differences are not always clear cut and different interpretations of vampires have always existed, but in general, they follow the same trends that we see with many kinds of monsters in popular media, becoming, over time, safer, more streamlined, and more watered down. Less monstrous, we could say. Though, as we saw with the examination of orcs, there is also the potential for great new opportunities in making monsters more human and with more complex personalities and varied motivations. I've thought about this concept quite a bit, actually, since I made that orc video. In fact, the way I see it, the traditional versions of these monsters usually gives us a lot of style and a strong sense of the monster's identity. This is a great thing, because without a lot of style, a creature becomes vague. It becomes mediocre, forgettable, it's just another face in the crowd. And if the monster is not strong, well, then it's weak. And a weak monster is not really a monster, it's just a mask. These traditional monster forms also impose limits. This is necessary. A game without many rules and limits is a pretty weak game. In chess, or Monopoly, or poker, there are very strict and very specific limited rules. But, at the same time, those limitations give those games focus, and definition, and style. It gives those games traction. It's that feeling of energy, and motivation, and maybe even competition that you feel while you're playing them. You feel engaged. If you think about it, the more precious something is, the more we surround it with rules and limitations. Something that is of no value has very few rules or none at all. 
What am I allowed to do with a piece of trash on the street? Who cares? What are the rules governing a little twig out in the woods? None. Who cares? What about the rules around your car? What about the rules and the limits around your own child? Or around the money in your bank account? What about the rules surrounding the original Mona Lisa painting? Yeah, there are very, very strict rules and limits in all these cases. Layers of rules. And there are consequences for breaking those rules. Sometimes severe consequences. Now, some argue that when it comes to monsters, the traditional approach is usually too confining, too narrow, and in some cases, bigoted. If we make monsters more complex, more variable, more human, then we can take them in new directions, with new creative energy and wider appeal or more user-friendliness. This is partly true. Culture needs new creative juice, it needs engagement and passion and activity. It needs a degree of experimentation. But what people of this perspective tend to overlook is the fact that coming up with good new ideas is very difficult. It's actually quite rare that someone is able to improve upon a legendary entity that has been developed over centuries. And even if someone appears to make an improvement, it may be a short-sighted and short-lived improvement that does not hold up in the long run, or maybe it even ends up causing more problems than it fixes. From time to time, a great creative mind does come along and truly does deliver a phenomenal new idea. We all wish we could be that person because the rewards can be staggeringly fantastic. But it's not something that you can accomplish easily or casually. One does not simply stroll into the Hall of Legends. Most who succeed are highly skilled and highly dedicated, sacrificing tremendous amounts in order to reach their goals. Let us not forget this, lest we fall unto resentment, envy, and hatred. If we destroy the foundations, of the Hall of Legends, we will find ourselves wandering in ruin. If we don't die in the collapse, that is. As an adventurer and bard, I have seen the ruins of many fallen kingdoms. It's easy to romanticize their tragic stories. It's easy to feel inspired with the prospect of learning the lore of their long gone society. But we forget that the people who once dwelled in those kingdoms didn't want them to fall. They didn't want to die and become just another set of ruins for future people to sift through, the same way that you and I don't want our world to collapse around us. We want to survive and live with the hope of a new day. That is a powerful force. And as Undead, the vampire, twists this powerful force around. The vampire should have died, but it persists after death. It survives by murdering others. It lives without the hope for daylight or a good society of its own. It is like a parasite, a creature of darkness drinking life from the creatures of light. Be wary, my brave companions. For the vampires lurk out there, and be wary that you do not become one yourself. Test out playing a vampire in D&D or another RPG. Explore the allure in a creative way and see what dreadful ends await you on your path of shadows. It will be one more incredible journey that gives you stories to tell and memories to share. I wish you the best with that, and as always, May your adventures be many.